Good morning and welcome to our Sunday morning service uh, at the Lebanon Church of Christ here in Dresden, Tennessee. Uh, we're grateful that you could join us uh, this morning. Uh, this pre-recorded video is being made available uh, for Sunday, uh, March 6th. Uh, we're now entering the month of March and are grateful uh, that we've been able to uh, kind of weather uh, the storms that have taken place uh, both physically and, and culturally and socially uh, in the last few months uh, and are able to meet together uh, and to share this uh, part of our service with you here uh, online. Uh, we are continuing to meet at our building uh, on Lebanon Church Road uh, just outside of Dresden. Uh, our service times, we have Sunday school classes for uh, all ages at 9 a.m., uh, followed by our morning worship at 10 a.m., which will be a uh, similar lesson to the one uh, you're seeing here. And then we have a Bible study, uh, just an informal time of, of discussion uh, and study from God's Word at 5 p.m. Uh, on Sunday afternoons. And if you're watching this early on Sunday morning and maybe you're with a family member uh, who's not able to get out or you're in a situation where you're traveling uh, but will be back with us uh, uh, tonight uh, in time for services, uh, please join us in person. Uh, we, we love that experience of being able to sing together uh, and pray together. And while we're thankful uh, for the technology that enables us to, to reach out and bring this lesson to you uh, today, we know that it uh, ultimately is no substitute for our in-person uh, fellowship uh, and the times where we're able to be together uh, and worship. And, and we're grateful uh, that we have been able to uh, come through uh, again this time of difficulty and while things are still uh, obviously ongoing in the world around us uh, we're glad to be able to meet together uh, to praise and worship uh, our Lord uh, and to have fellowship one with another. As far as our online service goes this morning if you've joined us in uh, previous weeks we'll be very similar today. Uh, we'll open here in just a moment uh, with a word of prayer uh, and then I'll share a lesson from God's Word. Uh, in March, we're beginning a new sermon series called Say What, uh, where we are basically looking at some of the things that Scripture calls us to uh, that do not seem possible. Uh, and in reality, they're not possible uh, in our own strength uh, and in our own uh, human ability and our uh, worldly mindset. And so these things that we're going to look at, and today we'll look at loving our enemies, uh, they're only possible when Christ is in us uh, and when his love and his life are being lived out through us. And so, uh, Lord willing, over the next four weeks, we'll have a, a series of lessons uh, that are all kind of based around that idea, uh, things that Scripture calls us to do, asks us to do, uh, commands us to do, uh, but that we can't do uh, in our own strength. And we'll begin uh, with that lesson uh, today, the first installment, if you will, of that series in just a moment. Uh, we'll have a moment to reflect uh, on that, and then we'll uh, have a couple of prayers I know many of you are using this video uh, with your families. Uh, maybe you're still uh, at home. Uh, you may be uh, sending this video or using this video with someone who's in the nursing home uh, or who may be in the hospital right now, and you may want to take the Lord's Supper together. Uh, and those uh, prayers will be uh, of use for that uh, and to kind of center our minds and our hearts, just like we'll be doing uh, at the building a little while later today. Uh, and then following that, we'll have a, a word about our announcements, our giving, uh, some updates on those who have been sick uh, and other activities going on in our area. Uh, and then we'll close with a word of prayer. There's been a lot of questions uh, about the uh, recovery relief, uh, as well as some of the things that we have decided uh, to pursue moving forward uh, as a congregation in the new year. And we'll have a couple of announcements that will pertain to that and ways that you can get more information uh, either we can email it to you or you can see it online or, or visit with us in person uh, so that we can help you uh, if you have questions or concerns about some of those things. Uh, again, we're grateful uh, to be able to be here with you today. We're thankful for this technology uh, that brings us together. Uh, and we're grateful that you have chosen uh, in whatever uh, state you are in, whatever situation you find yourself in today, uh, to take this time to join to join with us. Let's go ahead, uh, if we can, this morning uh, and begin with a word of prayer. Let's pray together. Our Lord and our Father in heaven, we are thankful for this day. We're thankful for the sunshine uh, that has been our companion this week and has uh, raised our spirits as we look towards spring. 
And Lord, we know that many in our community and many all around the world are uh, dealing with very tough circumstances, whether that be uh, recovery from the storms, whether that be uh, the wars and rumors of wars that fill the earth. Um, we know that uh, personally we have sickness, we have tragedy, we have grief, we have depression. Uh, we have things that are weighing heavy upon our hearts. And Lord, we ask that just for a few moments today, we can uh, bring those things to your feet, lay them down before you, uh, that we can admit the need that we have uh, for you to carry those things for us, that we can admit the weakness uh, that we have uh, in all aspects of life, whether that's uh, physical or mental, emotional, moral. Uh, and we ask that you would fill our weakness and overcome uh, our weakness with your strength and help us to live uh, into your strength each day. We're thankful, Lord, for those who are serving uh, in our community, for our law enforcement officers, for our first responders, for our local elected officials. We pray also, Lord, for those who are uh, running for office right now. Uh, we know that we have people in our community and uh, all throughout our country who are uh, seeking office uh, in the upcoming elections. And we ask that you would guide them uh, to help them make decisions that would uh, be for the benefit uh, of all and that we could be brought together uh, rather than further divided uh, in our community and in our country. Lord, we're grateful for the men and women who are serving all throughout the world today uh, in the military, and especially, Lord, as we are in this time where uh, the ongoing conflict uh, between Ukraine and Russia uh, has many of uh, our military and, and militaries all throughout the world on high alert uh, and hoping that the situation can be uh, resolved uh, without any further uh, intervention and without any further loss of life and we pray, Lord, uh, for the young men and women who are um, stationed in areas where they may be called into action at any time. And we know the anxiety that weighs upon them and the anxiety that weighs upon uh, our military leadership and our civilian leadership, the president, the Congress, uh, the various agencies that are uh, looking at this situation. And Lord, we ask that you would uh, help us to um, pray for them, to lift them up regardless of our own understanding of the situation or our own views of what should be done, uh, we ask that you would help us to be prayerful uh, and mindful of those who are uh, really caught up in this, uh, in this struggle. We pray for uh, the nations that are involved, for Ukraine and for Russia. We pray for the many uh, innocent people uh, in both countries who uh, simply want the right to live and to uh, worship and to work as they see fit. And we ask, Lord, that you would uh, bless the leaders, uh, President Putin, President Zelensky, and uh, the others who are involved in the decision-making process, that their hearts could be uh, open to compromise and uh, open to uh, seeking a solution uh, that will uh, limit the cost of life. Um, we know, Lord, that many of these things are uh, far beyond our ability to impact directly. And so we ask that our attention and our thoughts and our focus would be given uh, to prayer so that you can act uh, upon the hearts and upon the lives of those who are struggling. We are grateful, Lord, for uh, our congregation, uh, for each person who worships with us uh, from week to week, each person who uh, takes your light into our community we know that we often stumble, that we fall short, and we ask that you would help us to remember that uh, we have the ability to be an influence for good uh, and strengthen us as we make decisions to walk by faith and to walk toward you uh, rather than uh, to walk towards the shadows that would pull us away uh, from your heart and from your will. We're most thankful for Jesus, for his example, for his life, for his sacrifice, for how he truly modeled uh, the idea that we can love our enemies, uh, and we ask that you would help us to be more like him uh, in this way uh, and in every way as we face the challenges of daily life. Forgive us when we fall short of his example, when we fail to uh, appreciate and glorify you as we should. Strengthen us that we might be better in the future uh, than we have in the past. Watch over us and be with us and bless us. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.
Amen. Again, we're so glad that you were able to uh, join us today as we begin uh, begin this new series. I want to begin this morning by reading uh, a few verses from uh, the Sermon on the Mount, uh, where Jesus is uh, speaking. And this section uh, is found in chapter 5, beginning with verse 43. Uh, and it's really um, not only um, in, in the passage, in the center of the sermon, uh, but it's one of the focal points, I think, of Jesus' uh, life and his ministry. Jesus says this, You have heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven, for he makes his son to rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet your brethren only, what do you do more than others? Do not even the tax collectors do so? Therefore you shall be perfect, just as your Father in heaven is perfect. Again, that's Matthew uh, chapter 5, beginning with verse 43 and going through verse 48. Uh, in this passage, Jesus contrasts uh, two ideas uh, or, or two uh, interpretations, I guess we might say, of an idea. Uh, that we are to uh, love those who love us, uh, but hate those or mistreat those uh, who hate us. Uh, that is the natural way of thinking. Um, Jesus mentions at the outset, you have heard that it was said. Uh, and the first part he mentions is from Scripture. This idea of you shall love your neighbor, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Uh, but the second portion there, and this may be indicated if you're looking at it in your Bible, uh, is that he says, you've heard that it was said you shall love your neighbor uh, and hate your enemy. Well, that portion is not in Scripture, or at least not in the Scripture that uh, Jesus is referencing. And yet, uh, it was apparently a common saying uh, in Jesus' day, or a common mindset, uh, love your neighbor, uh, but hate your uh, enemy. I mentioned in our prayer just a few moments ago about the current uh, violence, the current conflict, the war taking place uh, between Russia and Ukraine uh, and the aggression that has taken place and the crossing of borders, uh, the shelling of cities, uh, gunfire, death, violence, uh, it makes a lot of sense uh, if you think about, even on that kind of national scale, that you would love uh, the people who love you, uh, your own countrymen, uh, your allies, but you would hate your enemy, uh, the army that is opposed to you, or the leader uh, that is opposed to you, or the nations that are opposed to you. It makes sense uh, in our natural human mindset that we love those uh, who love us, we're kind to those uh, who are kind to us, but we don't feel uh, a sense of obligation. In fact, we may feel uh, a revulsion, we may feel anger when we're told to love those uh, who hate us or mistreat us or hate those we love and mistreat those uh, we love. Not only is that true um, you know, on a national scale or on a worldwide scale uh, with the affairs between different countries, uh, that's true of the uh, relationships between individuals. Uh, if someone is kind to us, if someone shows us grace, if someone gives us gifts, uh, if someone is a member of our family and we have a close relationship, it seems very natural uh, to love them. It seems very natural uh, to reciprocate uh, the blessings and the goodness uh, that they show toward us. It's a far different thing uh, to be able to love and to bless and to show kindness to those who are indifferent and especially to those who are hostile uh, to us, those who would oppose uh, the very things that we uh, believe and that we stand for. And so why does Jesus call us to this? Why does Jesus uh, insert this uh, particular uh, portion uh, into really the most famous sermon uh, that was ever given uh, that we have there recorded in chapters 5, 6, and 7 of Matthew uh, that we know is the Sermon on the Mount. Well, um, I don't think, I think we can bear this out, 
that Christ is going to ask something of us that is uh, impossible. Uh, he's not going to uh, tell us to love our enemies, uh, tell us to do good uh, to those who mistreat us if it's not possible uh, to do that. And so I don't think uh, it's simply an exercise in rhetoric. I don't think it's simply, um, you know, a good idea that no one can actually do. I think it's something uh, that is possible for us. Um, and we're going to look uh, here in just a moment at how uh, we can go about doing that. I've broken this lesson down uh, into a different way than I, I normally present things uh, because I think it's it can veer off very quickly, uh, kind of into the weeds and trying to find exceptions to the rule and that sort of thing. So we're going to mention just, just three kind of components. Uh, the concept uh, that it's possible to love our enemies and then the actions uh, that we can take uh, to bring that about. And then what will result, uh, hopefully, uh, if we're able to take those actions uh, into our life and to make that application. So really just three kind of uh, broad ways of thinking. Uh, why is this concept there? How can we bring this concept to pass? And what are the benefits? What are the results uh, of seeing it take place? I would suggest to us that uh, if it is possible to love our enemies and Jesus asserts that it is, uh, then we have to consider it as not only a command, but something that there has to be uh, a way to do. Uh, again, it's not an abstraction. Uh, it's not, a, uh, well, this is a good idea, uh, but it never can actually be done. It is something that is possible, and Jesus demonstrates that in his own life. And so, um, how can we think about that in a way that is, is helpful? How can we think about that in a way that is uplifting. First, I would I would kind of uh, preface this, and I think I think we need to acknowledge that something is not impossible uh, just because it is difficult. Um, something is not impossible just because it is difficult. Um, we sometimes see articles, or, or we'll see a maybe a news program, and it'll talk about uh, a person, an individual, or maybe a family that was hundreds of thousands of dollars. Uh, in debt, and they decided as a family or as an individual or as a business that they were going to pay that off. Uh, they were not going to try to get relief from that uh, through some other means. It was debt that they had knowingly um, taken on, and something had happened to make them uh, unable to pay it. But in order to uh, be square with their creditors, uh, they wanted to pay off uh, that debt. Well, just because we have a desire to do something uh, doesn't mean that we will do it. And just because we have a desire to do something and we begin the process of doing it uh, doesn't mean it is difficult. Some of us have had the experience of going to marriage counseling or maybe counseling with, uh, with a child uh, who's going through a difficult time. And there may be a lot of problems. There may be a lot of things to unpack uh, in those sessions. But just because it's a difficult process uh, doesn't mean it's an impossible uh, process. And this is true uh, with many aspects of Christ's teaching. Uh, when Christ tells us, uh, you know, not to hate uh, or not to lust or tells us to uh, share our possessions with those who are in need, um, we're not given those commands as just good ideas that we can't actually uh put some effort into and accomplish, we're given those ideas as things that are possible uh, with the presence of Christ uh, in our lives. And they're not easy, even with uh, the right attitude, even with the right mindset, even with the right commitment, even with the presence of Christ uh, working in us and through us. Uh, they're not easy things to do, uh, but they're not impossible things to do. Um, we do, I think, a disservice uh, to the text, to these hard sayings of Jesus, when we read them and when we say, oh, I'll never be able to do that, and then we just flip the page uh, and go to the next uh, section. They wouldn't be there. Um, they wouldn't be commanded of us if they weren't possible. Uh, they may not be possible in our own strength. In fact, they won't be, uh, but we do have the ability to choose uh, to pursue these goals, uh, such as loving, uh, loving our enemies. 
Um, Jesus contrasts here, you have heard that it was said. That was the customary default uh, in his culture. And by the way, it's still the default in our culture. Uh, you know, I take up for my people. I love the people that love me. Um, you know, family is family, but, but uh, you know, I, I don't care about these other people. I have to look out uh, for my family first or my uh, country first. Um, that's the default response that we have uh, as people. That's true culturally. Uh, that's true uh, in relationships with friends or loved ones. And honestly, that's, that's true spiritually. Um, we can become guilty of, of trying to preserve what we have uh, rather than reaching out and extending uh, God's grace uh, to others. He contrasts that cultural default uh, with this christ field command. I'm not asking you just to love people who love you. Uh, I'm asking you to love uh, your enemies, love the very people uh, who would mistreat you uh, the most. Jesus always points uh, to a greater truth and a more challenging application I've heard people say, and, and I've probably said through the years, you know, I'm so glad we're not under the Old Testament uh, with all those laws and those restrictions and the dietary laws and all of those things. I'm so glad that we're under under grace. And we know what we mean, uh, I think, when we say that. But Jesus is not uh, just doing away with some technicalities. He's calling us to something higher. Um, it's not just enough uh, to go through the motions of loving those that love you uh, and hating others or, or dismissing others. Uh, we're called to something higher, uh, to love people even as Christ has loved us. I love what Jesus says in verse uh, 46 and 47, that idea of if you love those who love you, uh, what reward uh, have you? Uh, this past week, uh, I had uh, some time one afternoon, and I had uh, was making some, some visits, and I was close to Alamo, and I, I went in, uh, stopped by, they knew I was coming, stopped by to see my grandparents uh, who worship with us at Lebanon. And uh, my grandmother, my mother uh, was there too, and they had made food. Uh, and, you know, some of my favorite foods, there was cornbread and uh, fried chicken. There were all these great things uh, there to eat. Well, what Jesus is saying is it's easy to love those people. Uh, you know, it's easy to love people that give you gifts. It's easy to love people uh, who have treated you well. It's easy to love people who have sacrificed for you. It's easy to love people uh, who, when they know you're coming, they uh, prepare a meal for you or they uh, prepare a place for you to stay. Uh, it's very easy uh, to love those people. And Jesus says, anybody can do that. Um, any person, even in their own natural human strength, can love someone who loves them. But it takes spiritual strength. It takes a spiritual commitment to Christ uh, to love those who are not loving uh, toward us. Um, and speaking of, of why this makes us like Christ, why this makes us like God, Paul in Romans chapter 5, a familiar uh, passage for many of us, he says in verse 8, uh, after he's talked about, you know, that for a good person, we might dare to die, but no one's going to die, you know, just for somebody random. Uh, there has to be some sort of relationship there. They have to know about the person uh, and their um, their character and their quality of life in order to sacrifice for them. Paul says in verse 8, But God, in contrast to how we think, but God demonstrates his love towards us in that while we were still sinners, uh, Christ died for us. In other words, while we were enemies, while we were opposed to the things of God, God sends Christ to die for us and demonstrates his love uh, in that way. We have to love unlovable people, not because they deserve it. They often don't. Uh, we have to love unlovable people because God has loved us, uh, even when we were at our uh, worst. Um, we don't choose to love our enemies uh, because they suddenly have become good people. Uh, we don't choose to love uh, those that oppose us and oppose the things of God, oppose the work of the church. We don't choose to love them because uh, they, they have shown some promise or that they might respond uh, to our love in some type of positive way. Uh, we choose to love them and we choose to act in a loving way toward them uh, because of what God has done for us and because of what God is doing in us and through us 
when we allow him to be seen uh, in our lives. If we think loving our enemies is a ploy uh, to somehow, uh, you know, stir them up to be good people, uh, and that that's our primary motivation, I think we'll be disappointed. Um, I'm not loving the person because of how they treat me. I'm not loving the person of, because of how they might come to treat me. I'm loving the person because they're a person or they are a people uh, who are loved by God. And if I am a person who is living for God and trying to work faithfully in the kingdom, I have to have God's love uh, for others, especially when they don't return it in the same way. So how do we do that? Uh, if my love is not based on how I feel towards another person, uh, but on how God views the person, and on my awareness of how God has blessed uh, and saved me, even when I was his uh, enemy, even when I could do nothing on my own uh, to endear myself to him, uh, I couldn't prove my worth, I couldn't validate uh, my actions or my life before him. If God has loved me in this way, how can I uh, love others uh, in a way that is uh, consistent with that? Well, Jesus gives us uh, some action steps right here in this very uh, passage. We don't have to turn anywhere else uh, to see what uh, see what Jesus is asking us uh, to do and what God is calling us to do. Uh, and these action steps are these, if you notice there uh, in the passage. Uh, this idea of blessing those that curse us, doing good to those who hate us, and praying for those uh, who spitefully use us or mistreat us. Um, we can choose to act opposite to how we feel. We can choose to act opposite to our feelings. Um, so many of us, and, and we see this all around us, and we see it, uh, I see it in myself, uh, and you likely do as well, uh, we are very reactionary uh, when we feel attacked or when we feel um, mistreated. Uh, someone says something about us that's not true, uh, and we lash out uh, in response. Someone takes something that we said uh, out of context or, or doesn't give us the benefit of the doubt, but assumes the worst about what we uh, have done or what we have said. Or they see only a portion of what was done or what was said, uh, and they create uh, kind of a counter story that, that we know to be untrue, uh, that we know uh, does not represent what we intended uh, or what we meant in a particular situation. And, and our response is to lash out. When someone accuses us of something, we accuse them of something. Uh, when someone uh, tells something that's false about us, uh, we respond in anger, uh, we respond in frustration. Uh, and that is a danger uh, because it pulls us away uh, from our connection to Christ. It makes us more like the world and less like Jesus. And so Jesus gives us uh, a manner of thinking here that I think is helpful. We can choose, you can choose, I can choose to act opposite of our feelings of hate. Uh, and when we do that, it kindles the ability uh, to love within us. Just because someone hates me or just because someone mistreats me uh, doesn't mean that I have to hate them in return. It uh, doesn't mean that I have to mistreat them uh, in return. We can choose to act differently uh, than how we feel. That takes a lot of grace. Uh, that takes patience. That takes a level head. Uh, that takes a calmness uh, and a peace uh, that only Christ can give, uh, that peace that passes understanding, that whatever is going on around me, uh, I can choose how I react. I can choose how I uh, respond. We can choose to take intentional actions towards other people rather than just fall into this pattern of reflexive uh, reaction that can pull us away from where we need to be. I love this idea, uh, this kind of three-tiered approach that Jesus uses here. First, he mentions bless those uh, that curse us. Uh, in Romans, Paul uh, mentions this in Romans chapter 12 and verse 14. He's giving just really some some tips, if you will, or some, some good uh, proverbial advice uh, for the Christians in Rome uh, there in chapter 12. And he says in verse 14, bless those who persecute you, uh, bless and do not curse. Whenever someone uh, mistreats us, when they 
um, speak ugly to us, speak harshly to us when they curse us. Uh, and that doesn't, of course, just mean uh, profanity, but they speak evil about us. Uh, we have the ability uh, to go right back with the same, or we have the ability to choose uh, to bless and to choose uh, to let those things go uh, and to respond in a way that is uh, uplifting and wholesome. Uh, we will never win uh, a cursing match uh, with the world. If a person who is not a follower of Christ uh, or doesn't claim that allegiance is mistreating us or persecuting us or cursing us, and we go back with the same, well, they're expected to do that in the eyes of the world. No one says, well, I can't believe that that person did this. That's an expected response from them. But the minute that a Christian or someone who claims to be a follower of Christ responds in that way, in kind, um, immediately there's this charge of hypocrisy uh, and this charge of, uh, you know, I thought this person claimed uh, to be a, a Christian or, or claimed to be a, a faithful person or a good person or however they choose to word it. And so the minute we respond uh, to cursing with cursing, the minute we respond to anger with anger, the minute we respond to violence with violence, uh, as a Christian, we've already lost that battle uh, in the eyes of the world. Uh, Peter talks about this as well in 1 Peter chapter 3. In verse 9, he says, Let us not return evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, blessing, knowing that you were called to this, that you may inherit a blessing. When we bless others, we're not expecting them necessarily to bless us in return, uh, but we know that the ultimate blessing, the ultimate approval that we are seeking uh, is from God and is from uh, the people of God. And so uh, I think it's it's key for us to think about, uh, you know, it's not just a case of, I said something I shouldn't say. It's a question of when I respond in this way, uh, it limits uh, my ability uh, to witness to other people about the goodness of God and the grace of God. It limits my ability uh, to be an influence uh, in the community. Uh, it limits my ability the next time when I make a better choice and people can look back and say, well, remember when they did this or that? Um, those things may be forgiven. Uh, you know, we may have uh, made things right with God. We may have even made things right uh, with the other person. Uh, but when we respond in that reflexive, angry, reactionary uh, sort of way, uh, it's difficult to lose, lose that reputation. In the same manner, um, Jesus here mentions doing good to those um, who hate us at, at the very near the end of the lesson uh, in the Sermon on the Mount over in chapter 7, just over probably one page in your Bible. Jesus says, Therefore, whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them. For this is the law and the prophets. It's also what we sometimes call the golden rule. Uh, this idea of uh, doing unto others what we want them to do unto us. Um, by the way, that can look different in different circumstances. Uh, but Jesus' point here is, I'm not going to treat people the way they treat me. Uh, I'm not going to mistreat people in the way that they mistreat me. Instead, I'm going to treat people in the way that if I were in their position... I would want to be treated. Um, it changes our perspective, uh, and it allows us to have an open heart and an open mind uh, as we deal with the people around us. Paul picks up on uh, that theme in 1 Corinthians chapter 4 uh, when he talks about in verse 12, being reviled or being cursed, we bless. Uh, being persecuted, we endure. Um, you know, we're not playing the short game. Uh, we don't have to, as Christians, get the last word uh, in an argument or in a conversation or even in a, in a conflict. Uh, we have the ability to realize, hey, there's more going on here um, than is on the surface. There's something happening, uh, a spiritual uh, conflict here that I'm having, not really just with this other person, uh, but that's happening between good and evil. Um, I'm being drawn into... Uh, an argument, I'm being drawn into a conflict, I'm being drawn into uh, a situation uh, where there will be no winner. Um, I'm going to hurt this other person. They're going to hurt me. We may damage both of our uh, reputations uh, in the church or in our family or in the community, depending on the context. Uh, and so I'm going to choose to do good. 
even if the person doesn't deserve it, especially if the person doesn't deserve it. Uh, if Christ and God could give and sacrifice for me when I was lost, uh, sinful, could do nothing to um, be worthy of their grace and their love, I shouldn't expect people to have to get worthy uh, in order to extend uh, grace to them. I can protect uh, my family or my congregation or my community. I can have boundaries uh, in my life and in my relationship, but I cannot allow myself to be drawn in uh, to hating another person. Uh, I have to love that person, not because uh, they're being lovable, uh, but because of who Christ is uh, in me. And then Jesus mentions, finally, this idea of praying for those uh, who despitefully use us. Jesus, in Luke chapter 23 and verse 34, demonstrates this, uh, probably to the fullest degree that it could be demonstrated on the cross when he prays, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. We see that come up again with Stephen in the book of Acts when uh, this mob of people, some of them that he likely knew, are crowded around him, stoning him, uh, putting him to death in this act of mob violence, this uh, really lynching, uh, to use that expression, of a modern, um, of modern times, this, this unlawful execution uh, without any proper uh, defense or any proper trial. And yet Stephen uh, asks God, as he is falling uh, down uh, on the ground, and they are gathering in around him and beating him to death, quite literally, uh, he asks that God not lay that sin to their charge. Um, where did Stephen get that idea? Well, he got it from Jesus. Um, Jesus even appears in that context in a, in a vision uh, uh, to Stephen, uh, assuring him, of, apparently, of his course of action. And so uh, it is possible to pray for people that mistreat us. Um, I don't think any of us have been crucified, obviously, or even stoned uh, by an angry mob. But when someone mistreats me, whether that's something as small as cutting me off in traffic or something as big as uh, spreading rumors about my family, whatever the case may be, uh, it is possible uh, to pray for them when we have the Spirit of Christ. We can take those actions, and when we take those actions of blessing, of doing good, of praying, um, and we do them in a genuine way, in a Christ-like way, uh, it changes our perspective. Uh, on the person that we're uh, praying for, our enemy, so to speak, uh, but also our perspective on what God has done for us. The last thing I'll mention uh, is the result. When we realize that this is possible and we mention these actions that we can take, uh, the result is um, that when we love people when they don't deserve it, we are more fully shaped into the image of God. Uh, we are more fully um, conformed. Uh, to God and who he would uh, have us to be. Um, Jesus says in Luke's version of, of this statement in chapter 6 and verse 35, but love your enemies, do good and lend, hoping for nothing in return and your reward will uh, be great and you will be sons of the Most High for he is kind uh, to the unthankful and to the evil. When I, when you choose to actively love people who are unloving, who are unkind, who treat us in an evil manner. When we actively choose to do that, we are becoming more and more conformed to God. We are becoming, uh, as Jesus says in Luke's account, sons of the Most High, sons and daughters, children of God. We are being made in our Father's image. Uh, when we choose to extend grace and love and compassion to people who don't uh, deserve it. In First Peter, Peter, um, kind of as a, a summation, says in chapter 4 and verse 8, And above all things, have a fervent love for one another, for love will cover a multitude of sins. That refrain is, is found other places in Scripture, and I think what's powerful about it is this idea that it's not just that my love covers up um, the, the sin that I see in others, that it causes me to look past uh, their sin and see their need or see their hurt or see their loneliness. 
uh, it also causes me uh, to conform myself more and more to Christ. And when I am in Christ, as 1 John uh, 1 tells us, as I am walking in his light, I have fellowship with him, and his blood continually cleanses me of my sin. One of the ways that we um, become more and more like God is to become less and less obsessed with pointing out the sins and failings of others and more and more aware of our own need uh, for grace, our own need for forgiveness, our own need for sympathy and compassion that we can receive from God. We don't try, choose to love our enemies because it's natural or because it's easy. We choose to love our enemies because in doing so, uh, we become more like Jesus. And that's our ultimate goal. If we are Christians, if we are disciples of Christ, we are his followers, we are his people, and we want to be like him in every way. And we are given the tools right here in this one passage to begin the process of choosing to love people who don't love us. Jesus doesn't say it's going to be fun or that it's going to be easy or that it's going to be an instant change. Um, but he does tell us that when we are willing to put in these actions and to put these practices that we take from him and we take from his life into practice uh, in our own, when we are willing to do that, we are more and more and more uh, being formed and being shaped into who God wants us to be. I think that's powerful. Uh, the idea that, are we really supposed to love our enemies? Yes. Can we love our enemies when we act in our natural mindset and our human strength? Not at all. But when we allow Christ to be in us and to work through us, anything is possible, including loving people that aren't very easy to love, including loving people that mistreat us, including loving people and having concern for people and care for their souls, even when they've hurt us in deep and difficult ways. Um, if Jesus could do that, and Jesus says we can do that, then we should realize we can only do that uh, through our relationship with him. Again, appreciate uh, each one of you being here uh, this morning. I think this series is going to be a blessing to us. I've enjoyed uh, working on the lessons so far uh, and hope that they will be a benefit to you uh, to you as well. Let's take just a moment, uh, and if you're there and you have your communion supplies uh, available, if you'll go ahead and get those uh, prepared and get those out. Again, this video, uh, a little bit different than we were doing it at the beginning of the pandemic when we were uh, trying to do these live. We, we had a lot of technical issues with that um, at the time. And so uh, we've, we've taken the alternative of pre-recording these. Uh, it'll be the same lesson here in just a little while, uh, Lord willing, at the building. Uh, but one advantage of being pre-recorded is that everyone can do um, uh, to, can take part at their own pace. And so I'm going to offer a couple of prayers, one for the bread and one for the cup. And if you're using this as your uh, Sunday worship service here on Sunday morning, uh, I would invite you to partake of the Lord's Supper with us, just as we'll be doing uh, in a little while at the building. Because the video is pre-recorded, you can stop it, you can pause it, uh, you can uh, time out for a bit if you uh, have something happening and need to come back. Uh, but uh, you won't have to buffer, you won't miss anything uh, as far as it being live uh, as it was before. So uh, that being said, uh, if you've got your supplies uh, gathered together, I'll offer a prayer for the bread and pause for just a moment uh, and we'll pray for the cup as well. Let's pray together. Our Lord and Father in heaven, we are thankful for this day. We're thankful for uh, the blessings that you bring into our lives and most especially the blessing of Jesus. We're thankful for his sacrifice and for his uh, giving of his body on the cross that we might have hope of everlasting life. Uh, even though we were his enemies because of our sin, uh, he was willing to love us and to give himself for us. Help us to be conformed to his image and strengthened as we remember him in this way today. It's in his name we pray. Amen.
And let's also pray for the cup at this time. Let's pray together. In the same way, our Father, we take now the cup, which for us as Christians is the emblem and the symbol and the reminder of the blood of Christ that was given on the cross. We know that as we live for him and walk in his light, as we've made the commitment to be his followers, that his blood not only cleanses us when we come to him initially, but continually cleanses us from all sin. Help us to appreciate this sacrifice and to remember it and to honor it and to celebrate it until he comes. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Again, we're uh, thankful that you've been able to uh, be with us and to share in this time today. I do have just a few announcements, uh, and these will be of particular concern to the folks that, that normally worship with us uh, here in Dresden. Uh, so uh, keep that in mind uh, as we go through these, and I'll try to uh, move uh, pretty quickly. Uh, and some of these, of course, will be posted as well. Uh, for those who uh, are regular members of our congregation here locally, uh, if you're not giving uh, at the building, you're not going to be able to do that, uh, but you have your offering and want to give that uh, to the work of the church so we can continue uh, our work here in the community, just let us know and we'll get that uh, arranged to have that picked up or sent to us. That's fine. I do have a couple of birthdays um, to think about this week. Uh, tomorrow, uh, Monday the 7th, uh, would be Blue Winston's uh, birthday, and uh, we lost Blue uh, back in the fall. Um, and uh, was a was a uh, solid, uh, good guy, well known in our community, and uh, we miss Blue and uh, miss his presence with us. Uh, we're prayerful for Sherry and for Duke and for Emma Claire uh, and their whole family as they're continuing to uh, obviously to grieve and and to to be facing a lot of new challenges uh, without Blue's presence. On Friday, March eleventh, uh, Rebecca Pascal will have her. Uh, birthday, and we're always glad when Rebecca uh, can visit with us when she's here with her family uh, and is down visiting from Nashville. In our church news, uh, we did have Brother uh, Don Robertson with us last week from 21st Century Global Missions, and he gave a report about that work, and we were blessed by that and are thankful to have a part uh, in that work. Uh, also, with and related to missions, we have updates uh, from the Taylor family in Japan. Uh, as well as from Christopher Carter uh, in uh, his jail ministry work in Florida. Uh, we also have an update from Hillsboro about the Honduras work. Uh, and then Lance Mosier, uh, who uh, is currently in Henderson, uh, serving as the missionary in residence along with his family uh, at Freed Hardman. Uh, they will be with us uh, on April the 3rd, on Sunday, April the 3rd, uh, to give a report uh, kind of uh, retroactively about the work that they were doing in New Zealand uh, and the new work that they will be beginning uh, this summer down in Louisiana, Lord willing. So we want to continue to remember uh, Lance and his family and look forward to uh, seeing them. Uh, if you have uh, a thought about Magi boxes, uh, we're already starting to think about uh, our number uh, for those. And if you have questions about that, you can see me. Uh, there'll be a gospel meeting uh, beginning today. Uh, over at Greenfield uh, with Brother Larry Sweeney uh, as the uh, guest speaker. And uh, they have information posted about that online. Uh, if you want to check that out, you can uh, look at their Facebook page uh, and see more info there. Uh, it's not too early uh, to be thinking about our gospel meeting. Uh, if uh, conditions remain as they are uh, and or continue to improve, uh, our plan is to uh, renew our um, gospel meeting practice, uh, and we'll be, uh, we have that scheduled uh, at this point uh, for the weekend of June 10th through the 12th uh, in June, again, with uh, with Bobby Rawson. Uh, Bobby was supposed to be with us uh, a couple of years ago when we had to cancel that meeting uh, at the outset of the pandemic, 
And so we're looking forward, uh, Lord willing, to having Bobby uh, back with us. I know you enjoy uh, seeing him and knowing him uh, from his work at Alamo and as he spoke at uh, other congregations in the area. So uh, mark that on your calendar. I've had a couple of people asking, uh, had that date been set? Uh, and that is the date, uh, June 10th through 12th. It's a Friday, uh, Saturday, and Sunday uh, with Bobby uh, Rawson. If you are working, uh, or working, if you are worshiping, I should say, uh, from home and need supplies, uh, communion supplies, Power for Today booklets, uh, anything like that, uh, please just let me know and uh, we'll make sure that you get those. We do have a report uh, from our recent uh, planning meeting and budget meeting, uh, as well as uh, uh, we've been able to send out some thank yous uh, this week uh, for for the congregations that have uh, supported us in that in specifically in the disaster recovery. And we'll have all that information available at the building. Uh, and if you need that emailed to you or something like that, uh, just let us know, and we can do that too. Um, also, to just mention a few people who are dealing with uh, specific health challenges and trials. Uh, Sonny Todd, I was able to see him on Friday uh, for his birthday, and the family had come, and the great grandkids were there. It was a good, a good time. Obviously, Sonny's having a lot uh, to adjust to, uh, not just with his uh, physical health, but with his memory uh, and so forth. And so, please continue to pray uh, for Sonny as he's there at Paris, but also for Joyce and for their family as they're making decisions and trying to to get the best care for him at this time. I want to continue to remember Lanny uh, and Carolyn. Uh, Lanny's uh, report, uh, from what I have understood, uh, has been good uh, with the issues that he's dealing with, and Carolyn is continuing to uh, recover uh, from shingles and uh, is still uh, struggling at this time and want to remember them. Uh, Myra Deaver, um, who, of course, is um, uh, a member here with us uh, and the mother of uh, Angie and Amber um, uh, Culver, uh, Angie Culver, uh, 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 who worships with us also. Uh, we announced a couple of weeks ago that, that her numbers uh, had shown that she had a return of her breast cancer. Uh, and while those numbers did not look good as far as the stage of that cancer, uh, it has not moved into her organs. It was simply, um, I say simply, it was contained uh, in apparently uh, in the fluid around where she had had uh, her surgery. And so even though uh, it was bad news that that was there, uh, it should be it should be treatable. Uh, and they were grateful for that update. So please continue to remember Myra in your prayers. Uh, Ricky Dunlap is still improving from his surgery. Uh, Dolores uh, texted me, uh, I believe it was Thursday, uh, and we had an update. Uh, she has a um, a uh, appointment tomorrow on Monday. I believe this is correct with uh, a specialist. Uh, she's still dealing with some of the same problems uh, that were not uh, fully corrected from her gallbladder surgery. I want to continue to remember her. And she also um, has had an issue with uh, her teeth uh, and will be having a surgery procedure uh, on March 18th. So we want to continue to uh, remember them. They've obviously had a lot of health issues uh, that have kind of all hit them at one time and want to be mindful of that. I want to continue to remember Robert Hart, uh, Dickie's brother, who's uh, dealing with um, uh, the effects of a stroke. Uh, Richard Adams from our community. Uh, many have uh, asked that we remember him in prayer. I want to continue to remember Tommy Bradbury, who is at home, uh, as well as Lee Gwynn and others who may be uh, in the nursing home at this time. Uh, we have several... Uh, family members of folks in our congregation uh, that have been dealing with various health challenges. Uh, Miss Sue Brewer, uh, Miss Faye Robinson, Miss Jeanette Robinson, and and others. Um, we've announced some of those things as as they've come up uh, specifically, but a lot of people who uh, just because of age and, and health uh, are are struggling at this time and want to remember them. I want to continue to remember Sam Berry. Uh, from Alamo, who has made some improvement uh, after being in the hospital uh, with some side effects from, from a previous case of COVID. Uh, we would want to continue to remember um, uh, those who uh, are dealing with surgeries. Uh, we have several folks in our community who are um, struggling in that way. 
Obviously, too, for those of you who live here locally, seen a lot of the uh, impact of what's going on with the construction and the, the de demolition happening downtown. A lot of emotional uh, things going on with that, obviously, in addition to uh, just the financial and the physical aspects of that. Um, we've also been asked, uh, Sherry Winston asked that we remember Tyler Mayo. Uh, Tyler is the teenage son of a friend of Sherry's, uh, and they live in Middle Tennessee, and he has been diagnosed with bone cancer. And obviously, uh, at that young age, um, I believe he's 15 years old, um, that's, a, that's a very devastating uh, diagnosis. And so we pray that uh, there will be uh, good progress uh, for him and that the treatments that he will have will, will be effective. Um, there may be others uh, that I failed uh, to remember or to mention. I know we've had a lot of people who are traveling, uh, either with basketball tournaments uh, or uh, finally getting out now that we've had some decent uh, spring weather, and so we want to continue to remember uh, those folks as well. Again, if you're watching this on Sunday morning uh, and you're able to come to the building, uh, we would encourage you to be with us at 9 a.m. for Bible class, uh, at 10 a.m. for worship, and then 5 p.m. for our uh, evening uh, Bible study. So grateful uh, that you've been able to, to share this time with us today. Um, there's a lot of hard stuff a lot of challenging stuff in the scripture, uh, but when we are uh, connected to Christ, uh, his power is our strength uh, and gives us the ability to do hard things, uh, including loving those uh, who have wronged us or mistreated us uh, in some way. Let's go ahead and we'll pray and go out and uh, face the week together. Let's pray together. Our Lord and Father in heaven, we're grateful for this day. We're grateful for the opportunity we have to share this time. We ask that you would bless us as we go into the week ahead, that we would not seek uh, to avenge ourselves, that we would not seek to respond to evil with evil, but that we would seek to overcome evil with good, that we would draw on your strength as we are challenged by people that would misrepresent us or misinterpret us, that you would help us to see uh, the needs that are there, beyond uh, sometimes the bluster and the facade uh, that people are struggling, that people are hurting, uh, just as we have struggled and just as we hurt. And we ask that we would have the uh, strength of character and the presence of mind and the dependence on you uh, that we need in order to be able to love people well and connect them uh, more and more to Jesus. We're so thankful for Jesus, for his example of love, loving us when we did not deserve it and forgiving us continually even when we fall short. Be with us and bless us. Keep us safe and in your care as we go throughout the week ahead. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hope everyone uh, has a great week and we hope to see you soon.